Hello, my friends, and welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time. My name is Jeff Beveridge, and I'm excited to be presenting to you on this topic of being agile educators, applying agile mindset and tools to enhance your training projects. This was originally a one hour video and with the agile mindset during development, it actually turned into three shorter videos in a series on being agile educators. So you're watching right now, part three, agile in training delivery. We're going to talk about how we can apply agile mindset and tools to teaching in the classroom or in the virtual classroom. You can, of course, check out part one on Agile and Addy, the connections between the Agile mindset and Agile frameworks and the instructional design or training development and delivery model of Addy, Analyze, Design, Develop, Implement, Evaluate. And in part two of the Being Agile Educators series, we looked at Agile in training development. So on the instructional design side, as you're building your training, how can we apply agile mindset practices and tools to creating our training? Let's go ahead and get now into part three, agile in training delivery. Let's think now about how we can apply the agile mindset create an Agile environment, and deploy very specific Agile practices and techniques in the classroom. So first, the mindset. As a teacher, we can view ourselves as facilitators, right? It, it, it's not about what we know, it's about what they know, right? The old, the sage on the stage, all that stuff. And I, I to be honest, Especially, I know many of the people watching this training, you know, I know you, we've met. I know that you are that person who facilitates, right? Who guides and leads discussion, but doesn't have to be the only one talking, right? If that's not you, rethink about it. Rethink it, right? Um, a shout out to my good friend, Martin Shin from Learning Tree, who taught me that phrase. It's not about what you know, it's about what they know. And, and what I always try to help teachers and learners understand is that everybody is always right where they're supposed to be in the learning process. If they don't know it yet, they still need to learn it. Whether or not the textbook says they're supposed to have already learned it, whether or not the prerequisites, prerequisites said they were supposed to have already known it, right? Wherever you are in the learning process, no more, no less. There's no other option. You're right where you're supposed to be still more to learn. So if we can embrace that as teachers and then also communicate that to the learners, help take some of the weight off of their shoulders by letting them know that we embrace that, it can really go a long way. We can also trust and empower learners, right? And this is, again, going back to the way we work in exercises, the way we facilitate discussion, but it's also kind of the simple stuff. My friends, if we're spending 30 minutes barking at people to turn off their phones and uh, explain to them where the bathrooms are at the beginning of the, of the day, is that conveying a lot of trust? Is that saying like, hey, I understand that you're an adult and a professional, like pursuing a project management professional certification or whatever class you might be teaching, right? You, they're smart enough to be in the class, but they're not smart enough to turn off their phone. They're not smart enough to find the bathroom. Those are important things to cover at the beginning of the day. Don't get me wrong. But when we're like lecturing them on it, right? Speaking down to them, explaining what our rules are. And, and oh my gosh, like when we're threatening the punishments, if your phone goes off, I'm going to con confiscate it. I'm going to confiscate it. I'm going to answer it. I'm going to make you stand up and sing a song. It's, it's a waste of everyone's time, right? Let's, let's, convey to our learners that we trust them. Maybe ask the question, hey, what are some of the things that you think we need to do, right? And you know what? If nobody mentions in that ground rules conversation, turning off phones, and then later on in the day, somebody's phone rings, you know what you can do? You can say, remember to mute your phones, and then you can move on with class. It's as simple as that. It's as easy as pie. We can just trust people, right? 
They're motivated individuals. Let's give them the environment and support they need and trust them to get the job done. We can strive for simplicity in our examples. Many of you, as I, right, have taught earn value management, right? And I'm sure that many of you have taught earn value management in courses where the examples are several pages long of project background information, numbers in the millions of dollars, and not round numbers like different digits all the way down that string of nine numbers, decimals to the cents, to the hundredths of a cent, right? And I'll bet many of you have also taught the courses that are a little bit more geared towards the entry level, where like you're building a barn, four walls and a roof. Uh, each one of them takes a day. Each one of them costs a hundred dollars. Right? I've used both of those examples in classes that I've taught, and I've never once had somebody come up to me after the million billion dollar example and say, "You know, Jeff, I finally get earn value management. You know, this finally makes sense to me." I've had so many times people come up to me after the barn project example and say exactly that. Jeff, I've, I've tried to learn earn value management 10 different times. This is the first time it's made sense to me. Nothing about, the, nothing about me. Wasn't anything about the, the person saying it because again, I've said it the other way and I don't get that feedback. Embrace simplicity in what we are teaching. Yes, when they get out in the real world, they're going to need the million dollar example. But when they don't know what earn value even is, maybe a hundred dollar example will get the job done. And maybe the students will appreciate you for it, right? It's simplicity. The art of maximizing the amount of work not done is essential. If I can learn the same thing without a bunch of complicated math at the end of the day, great, awesome. And of course, as an instructor, you can embrace the Agile mindset by being a T-person, right? And I think in the classroom, this is allowing ourselves to be wrong, allowing ourselves to be corrected, allowing ourselves to learn from the discussion, from the participants, and allowing that to be visible. Like, not like, oh, better take a note in the back of my mind to look that up, but, but actually being willing and able to say to the participant, oh, tell me more. Oh, I hadn't heard that before. That's interesting to me. Oh, that's different from what I knew. Oh, tell me more about that, right? It enhances the learning process for a learner when the teacher is also learning and when that's visible, right? So this is, this is a valuable approach. It's okay to be wrong and it's good demonstration. You're setting a good example when you show your willingness to be wrong. If you're willing to change your mind, you never have to be wrong. You're just on your way to being right. All right, some more specific practices. Now that we've got the mindset, let's create the environment. We can use the classroom Kanban board. Again, I'm sure many of you do this. We see an example of a flip chart that I use in my Agile classes where we have the pre-populated learning backlog, right? My to-do column of everything that I'm planning to teach. And as we go through section by section, we move things from to do to in progress, from in progress to done. It's really great for helping the students visualize where they've been and where they're going, where they are in the learning process. It's really great for conducting reviews. All right, we talked about this, this, and this. It's really great for making transitions, especially when you want to make it clear we're moving on. We're done with one topic. We're about, about to talk about something else. You know, in your 40-hour boot camp that has 10 chapters worth of very different content in it, right? It's useful to have that transition. We can also use this as our parking lot. You know, that, that, that flip chart that when a question is asked that you don't want to answer, you tell them to write it on the, on the parking lot so that you can not answer it later on. <laughs> what if instead we said, add that to the learning backlog, and we actually put some thought into, okay, where is this in our to-do? Is this something that's already done? We, we're never going to talk about it again, and so we should, like, talk about it right now or build in some time for it? Is it something that'll nicely fit within another discussion? And so let's remind ourselves of it then. So it, it invites interaction, getting up out of their seats, writing on a, on a post-it note, that sort of thing. Very valuable. It also serves as an information radiator. 
I love this concept of information radiators in the Agile environment, where we make knowledge visible in our workspace. So rather than waiting until you're on the critical path slide for them to see critical path for the very first time, you could have your critical path flip chart up on the wall all week long, right? You're only going to talk about that for maybe 15, 20 minutes of your class, but it's up there all week long. And for the four days you're not talking about it, they're able to see it. You know, when it's Tuesday and I'm up there blah, 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 and they're daydreaming, looking off at the walls, looking at all the pretty pictures on the walls, well, it's okay that they're not listening to me for 40 hours in a row. I don't mind. But guess what? They've got something else that's valuable to their learning that they can pick up on. And oh, by the way, when we get to critical path on Thursday, now they've, they've heard of it before. It's not their first rodeo. They actually kind of know what we're talking about because they see that quick hit blurb. We can also apply right, some common techniques. Again, in conjunction with our classroom Kanban board, we could do the daily stand-up as a review activity. You can have them do it uh, as a class. You can have them do it in groups. You can have them answer the three questions individually. What did we learn yesterday? What are we going to learn today? What impediments are standing in the way of our learning? We could use planning poker, right? You know that, that uh, estimating game where the team members hold up a card with their story point estimate. Everybody votes at once and then we reach consensus. We hand out like a red card and a green card. Give me a quick yes or no. Give me a quick agree or disagree. I hand out an A, B, C, and a D, and then we'll do multiple choice questions. All right. Everybody, you know, nine out of ten think it's A, one person thinks it's C. Why do you think it's C? It's a good discussion prompt. And, of course, you get all of the value of what, you know, what we call the, the wideband Delphi technique. Everybody participates without the group think without the hesitation of like, well, let's see what uh, somebody else says before I weigh in. No, everybody weigh in anonymously all at once. You keep it moving. And oh, by the way, in the virtual environment, we've got the tools for this. We can do this live, real time to have them vote in a poll, right? Which answer do you pick? Anonymously and simultaneously and quickly so that we don't have to wait for somebody to virtually raise their hand and have all of that dead air in our virtual training. Oh my gosh, it was brutal for just that five seconds. Get away from that brutal, brutal dead air and move on to a nice, beautiful interactive poll in your classroom. Planning poker. And also, as we've talked about, like embrace self-organizing teams. In a lot of our classes, we try to, you know, drive home roles and responsibilities. Make sure you have your scribe. Make sure you have your note taker, your presenter, your spokesperson, that sort of thing. And that's really helpful. But if, if on Friday afternoon of a week-long class, they're raising their hand and they're asking you, um, like, who's our, our PM for this, for this exercise? Ugh, we've not empowered them. We, we've not uh, shown trust in them to self-organize. Let's try to give them a little bit of that breathing room. Let's give them the space to, like, oops, we forgot to select a spokesperson. We'll never make that mistake again. Let's let them learn the lesson. Let them fail. So, you know, roles and responsibilities, that, that's helpful, but let's not waste 20 minutes in the exercise setup on make sure that you know who's doing what. Let them figure it out. Trust them. My friends, thank you again so much for taking the time to watch this video. I hope that you can benefit from bringing the Agile mindset and embracing the Agile mindset in your classrooms and virtual classrooms. Again, if you have not already, I encourage you to check out parts one and two of this Being Agile Educators series. You can really watch them in any order. Part one takes a look at Agile and Addy. Part two takes a close look at Agile in training development. So before we get to the classroom, I've really enjoyed bringing you this series on being Agile educators. My name is Jeff Beveridge, and I would love to have you be a part of the conversation with me. You can reach out to me anytime at jbeveridge at cornerpostmanagement.com. 
You can visit my company at cornerpostmanagement.com or jeffbeverage.com. They both go to the same place, but it's been brought to my attention that my name, Jeff Beverage, is a little bit easier to remember than my company's name. So type either one into your web browser and you'll be able to find me. I look forward to that conversation. I look forward to seeing you soon. Have a wonderful day.